Thank you, Joel. Good evening, everybody. Hi, I'm Drew Diamond. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Federation of Tulsa and the Sherwin Miller Museum of Jewish Art. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the second session of the rise of anti-Semitism in turbulent times. I want to thank our partners, the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. They're the premier center for Holocaust, human rights and genocide studies and the American Jewish Committee, one of our leaders in global Jewish advocacy for making, they helped make this series possible and also to Charlotte Schumann for spearheading this effort. Understanding the nature of anti-Semitism is vital in our work to combat this very real threat that exists today. To that end, to get us going, I'll turn it back over to my friend, Joel Schweitzer. Thank you. Uh, as Drew said, my name is Joel Schweitzer. I serve as regional director uh, based out of our Dallas office for, uh, for the American Jewish Committee, AJC. We are thrilled once again to partner with the Federation as well as UTD Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies and really appreciate uh, the good work of Charlotte Schumann, who you know, really was the visionary behind this series uh, in the first place. Uh, one quick housekeeping note, as we noted last week, I find it's often very meaningful in programs like this to occasionally toggle back and forth between the speaker view and the gallery view, which you can do by hitting that view button in your upper right hand corner. Uh, in the gallery view, it gives you the opportunity to feel like you're a part of a community and then the speaker view obviously gives you the chance to, to really focus on the person who is speaking. Uh, with that, I want to uh, give the floor to Rabbi Fitzerman to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you, Joel, and welcome, friends. The question of anti-Semitism is as old as the Jews, and we continue to stumble after elusive answers. It's the most common question in my classwork with our own members in Tulsa, and I feel less equipped to answer as the years unfold? Is it a pagan reaction to our role as monotheists and an urgent desire to repudiate our role as God givers? Is it our ready adaptability to the modern world and the rewards it offers to those who master the aristocracy of merit? Or is it the lure of passionate ethno-nationalism and the perception that we are eternal outsiders. Dr. Romer is here to answer these questions and help us deal with this mysterious challenge. As you well know, he's the director of the Ackerman Center and a key figure in the study of anti-Semitism. He came to Dallas from the University of Southampton and he's done important work on the upward mobility of European Jews and the urban experience of being Jewish in Germany. He's associated with the most important journals in this field, and he has close links with the centers of European Jewish scholarship, including the Harvard University Press and the mighty Leo Beck Institute. With that, please let me call on Dr. Romer to begin. We have a tight schedule this evening, and I am as eager to hear Dr. Romer as you are. Good evening. Thank you very much. Let me just, first of all, before I get going, just make sure that you all see now my PowerPoint. Okay, I got the thumbs up. So thank you very much. I, I'm not entirely sure. I'm a little bit like you, Robert uh, Fitzman, that um, the longer one studies anti Semitism, the longer, the more it becomes also something that not just bewilders, but is also a remaining puzzle of sorts. Um, I think I want to add at least one dimension now today that I want to elucidate, and that is the kind of relationship between, I'm sorry, between um, anti-Semitism and nationalism. Um, but I, before I jump in, if you don't mind, I'm just going to say 30 seconds, some words about the Ackerman Center, and then I'm going to go from there. So I, I would, you know, fail, you know, tonight if I wouldn't introduce very quickly Zhuzhana Ashwat, who was our founding director, herself a Holocaust survivor from Budapest. Um, and then how she, she came from the one bridge, so to speak, to the other bridges of Dallas, where she 
created our Holocaust Studies program. In a very short run, she joined us in 83. In 2006, we were created as a center. Here, and I told you I'd give you the 30-second show, um, is now our entire lineup of all of the professors. Um, you've already obviously met already Professor Patterson. We just recently hired Amy Kerner. And then we have Deborah Fister and two visiting assistant professors. So it's a sizable center right now that speaks to the growth of the university, but also to the importance of Holocaust studies and anti the study of anti-Semitism. Here quickly, our mission, um, I'm not gonna read it all out, but it's the study of Holocaust, but also of genocides and human rights studies that stand at the center. Now I fall in line, I'm number two in a lineup of four, um, very distinguished speakers of a really, really interesting program. Um, and I come behind my colleague, Professor Patterson, who talked to us last week and highlighted in particular the centrality of blood, power, and redemption as the kind of recurring themes that he traced through the history of anti Semitism. And luckily for me, he covered already about a thousand years, so I can largely concentrate myself on a slightly smaller scale. But I will also use a little bit the fall back into the Middle Ages because. Outside of blood, power, and redemption, I want to you know, emphasize on, a, on another element, which I think is quite central to the understanding of anti-Semitism, and that it's the assumption that whatever anti-Semites think that they know has a timeless quality. In other words, the very qualities that they attribute to Jews do, are not subject to change. They are not affected by time, meaning history, nor by place, meaning geography. And those are two really, really important patterns, I think, that um, the absence of time or place explain in lots of ways why an idea can so quickly and so rapidly spread around the world and quote unquote become meaningful no matter where one is. But I, in particular, I wanna interlace this kind of timeless quality now with another kind of quote unquote assumption of something else that's quite timeless. And I'll be very specific about the way I'm gonna use this today and this is the idea of nationalism. I want us to start out with something that also seems very seamless and timeless, and that is the assumption of the Middle Ages of seeing itself here, Frederick Barbarossa. Uh, you'll understand later why I use this particular example. It's the head of the Roman Empire, meaning seeing the Middle Ages as the inheritors of the Roman Empire, and spearheaded in particular by the much venerated figure of Frederick Barbarossa, who had a leading role in the Third Crusades. Now, under his reign, this roughly you know, resembled the Holy Roman Empire that existed then for many centuries to come, um, and sorry, and kind of encapsulated this idea of a timeless um, inheritor of the Roman Empire. Now embedded in this kind of very timeless thing that seems to have spanned the millennium, existed also the views of Jews. And here we come to this quality that I wanna emphasize, a quote unquote, absence of time. We have here a depiction of a biblical scene, Paul arguing with the Jews, but the Jews are dressed in their medieval garb. In other words, thousands of years are kind of moving up and down here. They are just collapsed as if there's no, nothing that separates these medieval Jews from antiquity. I think this is important for us, and this is where I wanna go next, when it comes now to the moment when all of this comes to a crashing end. In 1806, this is what Roly Holman Empire, the first Reich, if you wanna call it that way, the first German empire comes to an end in 1806. And at the same time, um, what replaces it is a kind of patchwork of German principalities and states very colorful, but not very unified, at least for the time to come. So a kind of German federation created, headed um, you know, on the side by Austria, which also interestingly enough, reconstituted the limits and restrictions that had been imposed upon Jewish life and had temporarily been lifted by Napoleon and his armies, but then got reconstituted again by the, um, by the Congress of Vienna. But what it's telling in this moment is that in lots of ways, it's an unprecedented break of continuity. Whatever else we wanna make out of the Congress of Vienna, it comes at the cusp of 
all the kind of other forces that we identify with the 19th century, industrialization, urbanization, the new kind of paradigm of science of discovery and a kind of progressive view and understanding of history that sees everything in time as being marked by its place in time and space. Meaning whatever we look at is shaped and marked by its immediate time and by its immediate surrounding. So in many ways, this in and of itself radicalized a new way of thinking also about the Jews. Whatever the Jews may or may not have been, they, like everyone else, was at least in theory subject to change. At least in theory, the Enlightenment contended with the ideas that Germans, like French, like Austrian, like Jews, could be enlightened and could be changed and, and, and be transformed. But that was, in the end, a very short lived view. And by the time Germany is created as a nation state in 1871, Jews are indeed given universal um, emancipation and equality, but without social acceptance. And that has to do with the new anti Semitism that I'm going to get at. But what it's telling is, and I think really important for my story here, is how that creation of a German nation state was viewed as quote unquote, the second Reich and how its emperor Wilhelm very clearly drew on the example of Frederick the Bar Barbarossa and saw himself as the kind of culmination of this, you know, almost hundreds and hundreds of years of strife that culminated in the kind of creation of a nation state. So it is therefore not surprising that Barbarossa is one of the most celebrated national icons of the 19th century. And in particular, the, the German emperor Wilhelm does a constant, you know, almost obsessively draws on that historical example. He also in the creation of one of the largest historical monuments, the so-called Kiffhäuser in Germany. Here's the kind of slumbering Frederick Barbarossa, who as legend always had it, was in a slumber to be awakened in the future to be then fulfilling its final destiny. So what is important to this very specific idea of the German past is that it inspires the present, but foretells also the future. In other words, we have a slumbering emperor here, a sleeping emperor who will be a reawakened in the future. So past, present and future are very much intertwined, not unlike what I was just saying about the depiction of Jews. And it's in the midst of this kind of nationalizing of one's past, present, and future that something else radically changes. Because it's right at that moment when the German nation state is created that modern anti-Semitism is created as a more racialized view of the Jews. And it's here where now for the first time, the very term anti-Semitism is invented. And is invented for the first time here in 1873 uh, by a man called Wilhelm Ma um, in a pamphlet about the, the, entitled The Victory of Judaism Over Germany. What's telling and very different now to what, you know, had been at the center of Professor Patterson's presentation that here the threat is not a religious one, but a kind of a threat of power. Remember how he was drawing on the idea of power. So power is, is here attributed um, to the Jews that quote unquote, strive toward being victorious over Germany, which you know obviously is, is, has no reality whatsoever. Jews make a tiny of minorities in Germany and are nowhere close to having any kind of controlling role in the German environment. But what is important is it is the moment right at the cusp of the creation of the German nation state of a nation and the idea of a nation that it almost literally coincides it's within two years, the coining of that new term anti-Semitism. And here you just, I'm just randomly using one of his quotes. We have become so Judaized that we're outside salvation and a brutal anti-Semitic outburst will merely postpone the collapse of our Judaized society. So it's like power and redemption, meaning those two great terms that had been so central to Professor Patterson's presentation that are you know, also very central to this text. 
It's a text about Jews and it's a highly anti-Semitic text. And it's a text that is anti-Semitic, not just solely any longer because it's hateful, but it is adopting now the more racialized idea of Jews. Jews are not any longer Jews via their religion, but rather via the, uh, through their race, as this book stipulates. Oops, wrong direction. So I want us now to engage in something which um, is kind of the quick read of big books. I was told that I have to be quick tonight and that I want to be done in time so that we all have um, time to go to the uh, presidential debate. So we do not have time now to read any books. What I've done is I've taken three books and I put them into a little program that creates a cl word cloud as it's called. The word cloud represents the words by its size. So the words that are more sizable are most often used in that book. So I'm not suggesting that as a new way of reading, but it's a kind of uh, short abbreviated way of, of thinking about it. So here I have a text by Richard Wagner about Judaism and music, 1850, where he obsessively talks about Jews' inability to ever produce anything organically and of beauty. It is not surprising that at the center of this highly anti-Semitic text is the word Jew, because it is a, not simply a text that is anti-Semitic, but it's a text that is about Jews. Same here uh, for Wilhelm Ma, the victory of Judaism over Germandom. The bigger the words, the more often they, they appear in the text, right? And so you can see Jews and Jewish, Jewry, Judaism, those are the biggest ones. You might also like his own name a lot, but that's maybe a different story. But do you understand the idea that he obsessively talks about Jewish, Judaism, Jews, Jewry, and hence those words are bigger in this word cloud. Now I wanna show you something that I, you will find surprising and we're gonna to have to think about what that means. And that is we go, um, well, first here where I think we are still on familiar ground. We go to Hitler and his letter of 1919 uh, where he seems to be midway between this form of anti-Semitism that I just introduced and a new way of anti-Semitism. A lot of what this hinges on how we interpret actually the, the language here, but he seems to be suggesting at the end some really radical measure. This is 1919 when he talks about the ultimate objective, I bolded it, of such legislation must however be the irrevocable removal of the Jews in general. So in lots of ways, he seems to be drawn here on the anti-Semitic voices from the 19th century. Uh, voices that he's familiar with because these are the texts that gave rise to the anti-Semitic um, mayor of, of Vienna and of the various texts that Hitler reads. Anti-Semitism, by the time Hitler grows up, had become so popular in both Austria and Germany that there are no need any longer for anti-Semitic parties because virtually all parties have subscribed to some element of anti-Semitism. The parties on the left are anti-Semitic because they identify Jews with capitalism. And the parties on the right are anti-Semitic because they identify Jews with radical politics on the left. But whatever we want to think about Hitler, for all intents and purposes, we could say, if, you know, this is a short letter, that this letter largely is a text that is anti-Semitic and it's a text that is about Jews and therefore it consistently talks about Jews. Now I wanna show you something else. And then hopefully we can kind of start to understand, you know, get at something which I think is really relevant. This is now a word cloud of high, Hitler's highly notorious and famous poisonous confessional Mein Kampf, My Strife, this autobiography that he writes in prison. And the stunning realization here is that while we are looking at probably the worst and the most anti-Semitic text that we could possibly think of, right? Hitler's Mein Kampf. That this text, if we just use again our same method, we put it into a computer program that represents the frequency by which words are used according to the size, then this text reads very much like a political pamphlet, a speech, people, state, movement, politics, nation, and all, and then interspersed is also the issue of the Jews. 
What I'm trying to get at is that the change that we are experiencing at this critical moment at the end of the 19th century, that unlike the anti-Semitism of the past, anti-Semitism of the, of the modern age of the nation state is not only just solely an anti-Semitism that is adopting the concept of race, but the novelty is that being anti-Semitic does not mean that one has anti-Semitic views but being anti-Semitic is part of one's worldview of everything. So everything that one thinks about, that Hitler thinks about in 1923, 1924, whether it's about people, whether it's about state, whether it's about German, whether it's about politics, about every aspect, it is anti-Semitic. So in other words, it's everywhere. So in lots of ways, therefore, this is a text that is highly anti-Semitic, but it's a text that addresses all kinds of issues. It addresses issues of world, of peace, of war, of struggle, of economy, of education. In other words, of all these issues at once. And I think that's where, where it acquires its new menacing presence. That nowadays, anti-Semitism, at least from Hitler on forward, is not any longer restricted to anti-Semitic texts, but it's a form of hatred that now is part of, of more generalized views of the world and cannot be separated from those any longer. I'm jumping now from the history of ideas back to the history of politics and conquest. There's in 1941 when Hitler positions himself in very powerful ways as his new ruler of Europe after the initial success, military successes of the campaigns against Poland and the better part of Western Europe, he readies himself slowly in 1941 for a much larger uh, prospect. And that is the Operation Barbarossa. And now you probably understand why I obsessed the whole time about Frederick Barbarossa, because Hitler personally gives the military attack on the Soviet Union the name Barbarossa. Barbarossa, like in the medieval Frederick Barbarossa, the emperor of the First Reich, like Frederick the Barbarossa, who was the model for the Second German Reich, like Operation Barbarossa, the reawakened medieval emperor in the guise of Hitler, who will now reestablish the full reign of something that the medieval emperor will not have. Um, did not accomplish. So the naming is in lots of ways very telling, um, but it's also very telling that this Operation Barbarossa, the attack on the Soviet Union, will not be a military campaign. It will be the beginning of what, in, in the more narrow sense, we call the Holocaust, meaning the deliberate planned attempt to annihilate all of European Jewry not any longer tied to a specific place and time, the attack on Poland or something, not particularly tight or limited to one particular group, the Jews of Germany, or Austria, but as you will all know, now becoming a kind of more global quest for destruction, at least on a continental level, meaning Europe, if not crossing into North Africa as well. But what I really want you to just think about for a moment is this kind of strange coming together of a medieval emperor and its kind of continuous legends that are reinvented in the 19th century to give, you know, substance to the idea of a German nation to see the German nation as a culmination of, of battles that had commenced in the Middle Ages. And then to see Hitler in lots of ways thinking of himself as the fulfillment of these age long strides and, 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 and battles. And thereby from the start also thinking of, the, of his reign when he comes as, to power as the Third Reich, right? I mean, this is, the Third Reich after the Second Reich and after the First Reich. So there's a very clear continuation. But the establishment of this very new reign that he calls also the new order will from the beginning 
mean also the end of European Jewry? And this is at least what historians uh, establish that it is within the attack on the Soviet Union that Nazi Germany descends into genocide and then from there, um, you know, ends up, um, you know, essentially planning the mass murder of all of European Jewry, culminating as far as the planning stage is concerned into the conference of Lanzi. I have a few uh, more images here. I could go on with this. The most telling part about this is obviously that Hitler will not be successful in his military campaign. He will miserably fail in the attack on the Soviet Union, something that in your minds is probably associated with Stalingrad with the great losses. But regardless of his military failure, he will continue the pursuit of genocide all the way un until the very last day of his life, meaning all the way into April of 1945. This you know, kind of talks a little bit about that failure of the Operation Barbarossa, but we can jump over it because I wanna kind of highlight now a couple of these elements that I find particularly telling. So I emphasize, um, in addition to what uh, Professor Patterson had talked about, power, blood, redemption, this kind of timeless quality that uh, you know, lots of ways uh, Jews, whether of the Middle Ages, of antiquity, of modernity, from the perspective of anti-Semites, they exhibit always the same qualities. The other, and Hitler does this very um, effectively at the beginning of his biography, is that the ex personal experience that he has imagined or real in Vienna is for him revelatory about what Jews in the world are. In other words, the, the experience that an individual has is absolutely scalable. So what an anti-Semite anti thinks about one individual tells him something about all of Jews and any kind of groups in between. So space, time, size, all of this is absolutely, you know, can kind of be condensed and kind of be unpacked, which I, I think explains partly why it's so dangerous. You could see how the Nazis did this really successfully in 43, when they started making Jews entirely reliable uh, and guilty for, for the war itself. The Jews of America, the Jews of England, the Jews of France, the Jews of the Soviet Union. I want to jump though um, now into this, you know, I have like two or three more minutes into a very contemporary issue where however, of sorts, everything comes back again, but I think um, it highlights, I think, a little bit an element of where we are, and it kind of goes a little bit back to what I was trying to say about it, it less mind comfort um, biographical work. Unlike other anti-Semitic texts, Hitler's text was distinct in so far as it addressed common political concerns, but from an anti-Semitic perspective. If we go to today's, you know, challenges, and I, I'll stick it out with the German examples tonight um, and kind of leave the American on the scene for a little bit. Then we see that in the midst of the debates and demonstrations about the restrictive rules um, to contain the spread of virus in Germany, these outbursts of public demonstrations that individuals and groups bring together, a good number of youngsters that are demonstrating with cool slogans, we are the people, yeah, on the left side, that sounds innocent enough. Then you look at this one and you think this is a strange one because we've seen it in the already. These are not the flags of the German Federal Republic. This is the flag and the colors of the Second Reich, meaning of the Reich that was created in 1871. Wearing that flag does two things. It on the one side means that one does not identify any longer with the democratic order. And two, since one cannot use a Nazi flag, one uses that flag as a stand-in uh, because of the specific laws in Germany. Um, here again, you have that flag. Here you have that group that also QAnon, that, you know, the devils us in the United States as well. But I, I want to like finish with one last example, which I find very perplexing. And that is with this young gentleman. Um, 
Attila Hiltman. It's from his website. He's a vegetarian cook, highly celebrated in Germany. Um, also very popular in the US. He had gone to all kinds of morning shows. He has good recipes. Um, they're tasty, they're healthy. Um, he had built a whole career on this. Lately, he has a very different career. Lately, he is amongst the demonstrators that advocate against the German government for their restrictive laws that they're opposing. He shared anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, calling himself a German nationalist and says that Jews wanted to quote unquote, exterminate the German race. This is the idea that the virus is a creation of Jews. He also believes that our chancellor Angela Angela Merkel is the daughter of a Protestant pastor, but also Jewish and a leader of the Zionist regime. Now he's obviously nuts. I mean, that's, you know, besides the point. But he also thinks that Hitler was a blessing compared to the communist Merkel because she's planning a global genocide of 7 billion people together with Bill Gates together. Now, these people um, come now not from traditional anti-Semitic circles. His view had not been tied to, to racial theories or something, but to nature and health and the likes. But it's this this new anti-Semitism that I think we have ever since Hitler that's not contained any longer in anti-Semitic texts, but is everywhere that has become so pervasive that he has now found himself in the news because one of his other kind of claims is that he believes that the famous German museum, the Pergamon Museum, is Merkel's kind of satanic temple where she sacrifices things. And if you paid attention yesterday to the news, about 70 German art objects had been vandalized. And amongst them, the Pergamon Altar. And while the investigation is still on, it is believed that at least his rhetoric has contributed to the attack on these German art sites, including this Pergamon Altar. Now we can say this is crazy and obviously it is, but I think most importantly, it is an anti-Semitism of a new type. It's an anti-Semitism that weds itself now to all kinds of new ideas. Ideas about a virus, ideas about healthy living, um, not any longer you know, part of, of a particular ideology of religion or traditionalism or conservatism, not any longer you know, wedded to particular ideas of the nation or nationalism, uh, but it, People can nowadays embrace these kind of conspiracy theories and anti-Semitism virtually coming from all kinds of different places to this. And I think we see the beginning of that, just to come back to this, in this very critical transformation of anti-Semitism that Hitler accomplishes in his uh, Mein Kampf. Because when you read it, there are pages and pages and pages where he doesn't seem to overtly talk about Jews. He talks about the environment, he talks about uh, productivity, he talks about peace, he talks about all kinds of things. But in the end, race is, and anti-Semitism is the driving force. So therefore, therefore, his anti-Semitism is not that he holds anti-Semitic views, but is rather that everything that he thinks is anti-Semitic. And I think that's unfortunately uh, the little bit the anti-Semitism that we are confronted now with that draws as always on the timeless quality that can entirely conflate accounts of Jews during the Middle Ages, during the Black Death, now with the spread of the pandemic and jump up and down 700 years. It can cross the Atlantic and can move um, across the Mediterranean to bring together different examples because space does not matter and it does not allow for any kind of existing differences. And it also can constantly draw on this endless back and forth of what an individual may perceive to have been his original experience. And then using this very particular moment as a way of telling him something or her about the world. In other words, this kind of ability to scale from an individual to the world. I want to conclude, really conclude now with something else, which I find really perplexing. And I wrote down just one or two examples. This is the last survey of the claims conference. 
So I think we are now in a world where we're going to have to contend with something that is really perplexing. This examined uh, the, the knowledge about the Holocaust amongst millennials and uh, Generation Z, according to which 35% of the respondents in Oklahoma, 47% of the respondents in Texas did not know what Auschwitz is. And you know, that's really worrisome in many ways. But how do we explain that in that same context, 59% for Oklahoma and 64% for Texas had said that they had seen Nazi symbols in the last five years. In other words, how can we explain that the very people who do not be, are not able to identify Auschwitz can identify Nazi symbols and make sense out of it? How is it that they understand the language of hate, but do not understand any longer much about the Holocaust? That at least in my mind is, is the kind of perplexing situation that we're facing. Unfortunately, not just in the US, but I think more globally, um, the findings for, for Austria or France or Germany or England would be a little bit different, but in the end also not entirely different and are to say the least highly perplexing. I promised that I would be done around 35. I made it to 37. so. I overstepped myself by two minutes, but I want to leave a little bit of questions and also be able to alert you at least to one of our upcoming events this um, Sunday, where uh, we have a chance to learn something about one of the last living Nuremberg prosecutors. But I'll leave now my PowerPoint to open up the channel for discussions, comments, um, or any other um, kind of forms of communication. So let me just stop this here. And so this way I can see more of you in one go. Thank you, Niels. Thank you. And I wanna remind our audience, you can put your, uh, your questions in the chat and, uh, or, or you can also just indicate that you have a question and, and I'll call on you uh, to ask it uh, if you would prefer to do that. But I'll, I'll start with, uh, with a quick one. You, you closed with a paradox I'd like to, to pose another one, and, and that is I've noticed a trend among the, uh, the alt-right, which uh, you know, has kind of disappeared a little off the radar screen in the light of QAnon, but, but uh, when, when they interview some of the top figures among the alt-right, you, uh, you see a lot of times a lot of praise for the Jewish state, for the state of Israel. And so you have this group of virulently anti-Semitic uh, activists on the one hand marching through Charlottesville saying, you know, blood and treasure and Jews will not replace us, uh, blood and soil rather. And on the, uh, on the other hand, they'll speak very positively and, ad and, and admiringly about Israel. How do you square that circle? I don't think that's so much of a paradox. I mean, if we just stay a little bit, you know, more locally, or at least that's what is locally mine right now. I live in uh, north of Dallas and Frisco. So between Frisco and Dallas is, is Plano. This is where uh, the assailant from El Paso came from, a high school kid. If you read his manifesto, he advocates for what he calls population transfer. So in lots of ways, he, he is very respectful of the state of Israel and even of many other groups but he wants them all separated out. So his way of solving, quote unquote, the, the problem that he's facing is to think that the solution is to transfer people out of the state of Texas and to make then some of the remaining states homogenous. So in so far as one can endorse another form of nationalism, Jewish nationalism in the form of the state of Israel, as it helps to create a kind of more homo homogenous society or state at home, that's no paradox at all. Remember, you know, just let's go with some parallels. The Nazis didn't right away embark on genocide. They first plan in the 30s was to harass, intimidate, uh, and sway Jews to mass migrate. Um, and they were in lots of ways highly supportive of anyone who wanted to leave Germany um, in, in this coerced manner uh, because their first cause of action was to try to kind of create it, what they deemed a more homogenous, racialized folk is, you know, community. So I don't see there much of a paradox that quote unquote support of, you know, or alleged support for the state of Israel uh, combined with 
you know, vitriolic anti-Semitism and racism on the other side. Thank you. And now, now that someone's jumped into the pool, we're starting to get a lot of questions. So we'll, yes. uh, we'll see how many we can power through. Jude Botwin would like to know, what is the origin of the word anti The word anti -Semitism? So it comes actually from, from within the field of linguistic studies. So in the 1860s and 1870s, both in Paris as well as in Germany at the universities, there are increasing numbers of very learned men who study Semitic languages. And Semitic languages are both Hebrew and Arabic. And so it's that designation of the quote unquote Semitic, which at first comprises both Jews as well as uh, Muslims that gives rise to this particular coinage and is you know, very deliberately used as a way of uh, separating it out and to, you know, making it different from traditional form of religious motivated hatred of Jews. I'm so that's the, the, yes, sorry. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna combine two questions because I think one kind of follows from the other. Why do you think that so many millennials and Gen Z are not, uh, are, are not fully aware of the Holocaust? And then following from that, how could we work to more strongly integrate Holocaust education as part of mandatory secondary level educational curricula? Okay, so I'm glad that I have like eight more minutes just to solve these smaller issues. So let me go at it. Um, I think the, the the, the first question is perplexing. Why do they know so little? Because in lots of ways, if we just kind of think about that generation, we all can very quickly remember that it's within the last 20, 30 years that there have been an abundance of Holocaust-related popular movies, that there have been more new Holocaust museums that opened up in the period, that many states mandated Holocaust education um, in middle and high school. In other words, this is precisely in the period where there's presumably more Holocaust education than in the decades before. So how is it if there's more education that there is less knowledge? I think you know, the, the, the answer to this question is probably a bit complicated, but I think it has a little bit to do with the way we do education these days. Because if I were to ask them about the poll about let's say any aspect of American history, my assumption is the results would be equally miserable. Um, that in lots of ways, there is a fun, you know, more general, general problem with how we educate students these days about history. And we have to solve that. And I, and I think um, you know, we're trying to get it also at the university. We have to try to figure out new ways of, of engaging students and not making this really something that, you know, where they have to master a couple of names and dates and kind of characterizations that do well for multiple choice tests, but something that they re realize that these are questions that need their engagement, that they need to wrestle with, that they need to understand that they speak to them. And we don't always do a good job and we have to get better at it. Um, and that goes to the, to the, the you know, kind of the second point, how do we solve it? I think we're getting to this, um, but I think, we have, I think, done not always a good job in making the students, not just the recipient of, of our teaching, but the participants of learning, which is very different. It's one thing for me to pontificate and lecture for hours and hours. That's my profession. I can do this for hours and hours, trust me. Um, it's another to kind of think about learning as a collaborative effort. And I think we see this change now occurring right now at our universities uh, that we are shifting away from just simply, you know, lecturing and lecturing and then testing knowledge. And we're, we're looking more for this kind of connection with our students and our students are looking for that connection. So I think we, we need to think about how we educate in different ways and in particular with this highly sensitive topic where we might have always felt how dare you little 14 year old, but what do you have possibly to say about the, the importance of the Holocaust to me who studied this for over 30 years? No, that's not how we can teach. We have to take their voices and their views a bit more seriously and also their respective places from where they come. Very important to my university. We are a very diverse campus. I have to change the way I interact with students that are now from India or from Latin America who are in my classes they come to this in a different way than I did. 
uh, when I was born um, some years ago um, in Germany, right? And so I have to acknowledge that and, and work with this. What, uh, what percentage of students of the Ackerman Center would you say are, are non-Jewish? And, and what are some of the common threads you've seen that have motivated them to, to take on this course of study? So the, the number of, of students that are Jewish are the smallest minority. I mean, if you think about students as students enrolled, degree-seeking students. So that's a small percentage. I mean, we don't account for it, but anecdotally, I would, you know, say a very small number. Um, you know, the one of my 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 you know when I go you know to talk about the center, one of the things that I usually do is I line up a whole bunch of pictures of our students, and then I talk about each one of them. And then I kind of look at my audience and I say, what do they have in common? And then I see all these question marks and these perplexed eyes looking back at, at me. And then I say, exactly, nothing. Um, because the one is young, the other one is old, the one is a woman, the other one is a man, one of them is Christian, the other one is Muslim, one of them is Hindu. There's nothing any longer where I could you know, see common denominators. I, the only more general answer I can give you that we have the preponderance of students who come to these classes because either they themselves have, have a sense of them being marginalized in either in, in their current lives or in their lives where they had come from as minorities, or respectively, they have been part of communities that have themselves experienced, let's say, violence in the widest sense um, in, in the countries that, that they fled. And so that's one of the bigger common denominators that you know, I taught in the spring a class on the history of refugees, and we interviewed the students, who they are, why they're interested, and about a quarter of them said that they themselves or their parents had, or had been um, refugees and had been dislocated um, at some point or another in their lives. So I think that's maybe the, the, the common denominator that I could find. But otherwise, it's Diversity, really diversity. There's not, you know, a big common denominator otherwise, which makes it really interesting to teach them. Thank you. Let me combine two to close really quickly, and then we'll, uh, after you answer, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, so Scott Pendleton asks, what is the aspect, uh, the impact rather of a U.S. president whose daughter, son-in-law, and grandchildren are Jews? And then sticking with the kind of modern culture question, Janice Feiner asks uh, about, you know, probes a little more about your discussion about uh, Attila Hildeman being a popular celebrity chef on one hand and an anti-Semite uh, on the other, and wonders if there's been public outcry about uh, what he's espousing from the non-Jewish German community from the German Jewish community or from the German government? And what can you tell us about, uh, about that? So, sorry, remind me again, what was the first question? The so the first, first one, is there, has there been an impact, positive or negative, oh, yes. on, on anti-Semitism from having a president? Um, well, that's always you know, the hard question to answer because um, we have a lot of anti-Semitism right now, in, both here and, and, and in Europe. So, I, I therefore fail to see any kind of la larger lasting impact of sorts. But I think, um, let me also answer the question in a different way. Anti-Semitism, and uh, you know, maybe uh, just let me clarify this, has little if anything to do with Jews. It has everything to do with anti-Semites, nothing with Jews. It's not that the views of anti-Semites are built around experiences of Jews, whether it's its daughters or in-laws of presidents or otherwise. Um, this is not a, a way of thinking about the world that is based on reality or on real you know, experiences or on real data of sorts. It's more of a, I, you know, what our you know, celebrity chef cooks up in, in his head. That is some wild stuff that has nothing to do with reality um, or with, with Merkel or anybody. So I think we have to be really careful that, you, you, what anti-Semites and their views have everything about is about the fears that they have about their society and what that means to them, right? And we see this on the alt-right, that there's this imagined fear about the end of a white America. Um, but that has nothing to do with Jews or with any of the other minorities or what they 
do or don't do. It has everything to do with the perceived reality in the minds of, of these individuals and with the values that they ascribe to. The celebrity chef, don't cook his stuff any longer. Um, that's the first answer that I would give you. Um, yes, there's been tremendous outcry and many companies that had initially been supportive of him and of, of his books, his cooking books that also had been translated into English have distanced themselves from it. And he has been questioned by the police and he has been antagonized and kind of isolated in other ways. But it's, I mean, Germany is in the throes of trying to, to figure out what is this? We had these demonstrations where people think that the ways by which the German government deals with the virus is kind of indicative of, of some kind of a wild conspiracy. I mean, let me remind you that statistically speaking, Germany has dealt actually very well with the virus. Um, it has contained the spread actually quite well, but not in the minds of these individuals. And there's a kind of confluence of frustrated youngsters of all the right figures of um, all kinds of voices that come together. And he's just unfortunately one of them. And because of his status of a celebrity, he attracted a certain command at first. But the stuff that he thinks it's, I mean, to call it wild is, is understating it, it uh, by quite a bit. This is a fantasy that is driven by, by fear and even more complicated in his fact because he is second generation Turkish. So he himself is an immigrant um, in lots of ways, a highly successful immigrant in the German society. Um, so it's not the model of a disenfranchised individual or something like that, uh, but a very confusing and very perplexing mind to say the least. But the point that I was trying to make with that is that nowadays, if we look back in the 19th century, we see anti-Semitism at the predictable places coming from out of a predictable kind of ideas. Nowadays, there's really hard to predict where we, we find the anti-Semitic voices, other than the assumption that we find them a lot and way too much and in way too many different kind of gatherings and collections that overtly we would have thought had nothing to do with these anti-Semitic views one way or another. I mean, what does the pandemic have to do with any kind of thoughts about Jews? Uh, unless one has already uh, this very view of the world to begin with and subscribes to conspiracy theories. And that's, I think, what is perplexing. I'll end with this to stay at least roughly in my time limit. That's what I find so perplexing that people can now read and identify anti-Semitic slogans and symbols with ease, but struggle to name a concentration camp or, or to, to name the number of victims, meaning 6 million of the Holocaust. How do you bring those two things together? That I find troubling and perplexing both at once. You will hopefully um, have finally all the answers to all of your questions next week. Remember, this is a four week endeavor. So each one of us can get away and giving only a partial um, mm -hmm. answer and kind of throw the hot potato forward and say the next one will answer all the questions. Uh, but again, I appreciate very much you being here and taking the time and um, also sticking it out and uh, being here again next Thursday. I'm afraid we're running out of time because we all probably wanna, want to is maybe the wrong word, but we probably feel for one reason or another that we wanna follow the presidential um, debate. Thank you. Be well everybody. and be safe. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye everyone.
All right. And good evening and goodbye to everyone.